Hey y'all, it is I, Anthony the Canadian Guy, and welcome to WrestleSode, the solution to your wrestling information problems. WrestleSode is a member of the Win Column Sports Networks. So remember to check us out at wincolumnsports.ca to be kept up to date on everything happening here in Alberta in the world of wrestling. Today I am very excited to be bringing you my interview with the Stormbringer to kick off what I am calling the Bad Seeds Week as I have three interviews for you this week. We're kicking it off with the Stormbringer, followed by his tag team partner and amazing wrestler, the cowboy Bryn Watts, followed by the tag team interview itself with the Bad Seeds. Now these guys are amazing and I can't wait to share this with you. This interview here with the Stormbringer, it's a great interview, a lot of amazing stories and great it's just it's it was just such a great interview. I can't wait to share this with all of you. But before we get into that, just a couple of quick things to talk about. Did you know that the Wing Column Sports Network is on Patreon? Just go over to patreon.com forward slash WCSN. If you're looking for ways to help, you know, grow everything here on the WCSN, help us expand, um, you know, get more stuff, just continue to help support the WCSN. That's the best way to do it over at patreon.com forward slash the WCSN. You get for earlier access to different podcasts and everything. It's a great place. And of course, we want to give a big thank you to everybody who has been uh, contributing over there at the WCSN. WCSN. So a big thank you to Eric Cross and Andre Como for being uh, supporters of the WCSN and our first patrons, I suppose. As well, just before we get into that, there was a really cool announcement this week. You may have heard of it. It's called the Northern Alberta Invitational, something that uh, I've got a chance to be a part of, and it's been so much fun, and I can't wait to uh, share more of that with you guys this week. Um, you know, we had uh, the tournament announced over the weekend, and... Uh, I'm all smiles today. It, it's it's a lot of fun. So if you haven't heard about that, go check me out on Facebook at WrestleSode. All my information is there on Twitter at WrestleSode. You can see everything to do with the Northern Alberta Invitational there. Use the hashtag NAB. I N V. If you guys want to make any comments on Twitter or on Facebook and we want to read them, we'll take a look there. Also, the brackets have been released, guys. If you haven't yet, remember to go and put your bracket estimation in and send it to us. We would love to know. Of course, I will be on Backbreaker Media this Wednesday. Um, it's going to be a live on, I think it's going to be on Facebook and on Twitch. It's going to be on a couple of different things. But uh, we're going to be talking about the Northern Alberta Invitational. Uh, me and uh, Paul, of course, from the YYC Wrestling Hub, um, a.k.a. the Wrestling Rodeo. In uh, Spencer Love over at the WCSN, and of course Mike the Ref Malawani is. It's gonna be so awesome! I can't wait to talk about this with you guys. Like, it's gonna be incredible. You come, come tune in because there's gonna be some cool stuff that you're gonna be hearing. I can't wait to talk about it. Anyways, uh, that yeah. Let's just get into our interview with the Stormbringer now. Sorry about that, but there you go. Let's get into the interview. Hello, friends. This is Spencer Love interrupting your regularly scheduled podcast experience to remind you to tune in to wincolumnsports.ca every Wednesday for Conversations with Love, the one-on-one -on -one interview podcast featuring the best of the best in Canadian pro wrestling and available wherever podcasts are played. Tune in to CWL on the WCSN for your previews, reviews, breaking news, and now interviews proudly brought to you by Beercade YEG. Hey everybody, Anthony here. I am joined with the Stormbringer. Stormbringer, how are you doing today, buddy? I'm doing outstanding, man. Thank you so much for doing this with me. Oh, I can't. I, I'm so excited to be chatting with you here today. Obviously, I'm going to be chatting with you. I'm going to be chatting with the Cowboy. And then, of course, we're all getting together and we're going to be talking, you know, you guys as a tag team. So there's going to be a whole lot of awesome Bad Seed stuff going on here today. I cannot wait. So thank you for joining me here today. Well, well, thank you for indulging my ego. Appreciate it. <laughs> I will happily. I could feed you. I could feed your ego all day. This is what I'm good at. <laughs> I don't know, man. My, my ego is always hungry. Just, just, just ask anybody involved with PPW. They'll tell you that. Yeah. Or ask a lot of people involved in pro wrestling throughout the North American continent, and they'll tell you that. Hey, you know what? I have a couple of questions for you when it comes to your North American content or, or the the content around North America that you've done in terms of wrestling, because I've looked into your past and I've seen some of these matches that you have done in the past, things that I'm incredibly excited to be talking to you about. For instance, you with uh, alongside things like ECCW wrestled for the NWA and in a single match in a two on one match defeated El Fantasmo, for instance. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I did a little bit of digging, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that. You know, it's 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 funny. Um, you know, I'm the kind of guy, and I and I've had to teach myself to do this. Um, you know, Vince McMahon is the type of person, and and many people that I'm a fan of in the world of entertainment talk about how you've got to be careful to not live in the past, and you always want to be trying to write your next great song or create your next great piece of art. 
And, and it's great to have a legacy and it's great to have a past and that's your foundation, but you got to be careful to not live in it. You got to be careful to always be looking forward. And I think even in your personal life, you know, you've got to be careful. Uh, my father has a saying, you know, insane asylums are full of people who can't get over the past. <laughs> so you want to be careful and you want to be looking ahead. And it's funny because even within PPW, a couple of times they've written about a career highlight in the, uh, in the program for a live event. And I've literally walked up to the PPW office and been like, hey, is this a shoot? And they, they, they burst out laughing the one day and they're like, you're not a, you don't remember that, do you? And I'm like, I honestly don't. Thank you so much for reminding me. <laughs> so, that's, I guess. One of those, that's one of those memories right there where it's like, wow, uh, thank you. I, I, I guess I did, did more things in this business than even I give myself credit for. You're just like, well, I guess everything kind of blurs together over time, and you don't really look at your day-to-day, but when people look back at everything, you go like, holy crap, I did a couple of things, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, man, it's, it's really cool. It's, uh, you know, uh, if, you, if you told the, you know, the teenage kid with the Ultimate Warrior and Hulk Hogan on his wall and Motley Crue and Metallica posters, and I would lay in bed and I would be look up at these posters and think to myself, like, I'm going to be a rock star, and I'm going to be a pro wrestler, and just, you know, live in rock and roll and live in pro wrestling 24-7. You were to tell that that dip, dip-head little kid that I would pull it off. I mean, realistically, no way. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful and so fortunate because I am literally one of those morons who just went and stuck to it and, and, and lived out his dreams and, and on a few different levels, not just pro wrestling. And... I'm just so grateful and, and so fortunate and, you know, to have people, you know, like you said, like dig into my wrestling career. I can't believe there's a career to dig into. <laughs> like, thank you. Wow. Thank you. You know, looking up at the sky. Thank you. You're very welcome. So that's a great place to kind of start. We can start there. So like, how did it all start for you? What made you fall in love with wrestling to begin with? Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan. There, um, I'll, t- I'll tell you guy. I'll tell you something, man. I am so lucky. Uh, moved up into northern Alberta, and uh, my stepdad had bought a satellite dish, the old school gigantic satellite dish that's like mm-hmm. six feet by six feet in your backyard. Yeah. And um, the, having access to things like the USA Network. And I remember seeing small time pro wrestling on what was available on television in, uh, you know, in Western Canada. Uh, I grew up in Western Canada. And it's Saskatchewan and Northern Alberta is where I grew up. And, you know, getting to watch the USA Network and the very first big-time pro wrestling show I ever saw was the episode of Primetime Wrestling where Hulk Hogan beat the Iron Sheet. Oh, that would have been a great one to start in, hey? Can you imagine that's your first big-time pro wrestling experience? I I gotta say. Unbelievable that that was the first thing I got to see. And... And then, of course, you know, making friends with a kid that was, you know, as big of a heavy metal pro wrestling geek as I was. And uh, then because we both had satellite dishes, we had a- we had more access, ironically, to the NWA than we did anything else uh, because of Turner. And so, you know, seeing Sting and Ric Flair and, uh, you know, the famous Sting, Ric Flair, 45-minute uh, time limit draw that I believe they put on opposed to a WrestleMania. If I remember my history correctly, somebody out there might be telling me I'm right or wrong as they're listening to this. But to be able to watch stuff like that live. So, I mean, I'm, I'm as old school as it gets, Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair. I that, mean, that, that was, I mean, to, to be able to, to grow up on that type of wrestling and just, I, I just have those memories and purchasing pro wrestling illustrated all the time and, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm old school, man. That's what got me into it. That would have been a fantastic way to, like you said, breaking into wrestling, watching that match. They, there would be very few that I could say can contend with something like that. I feel like I have a pretty good story, though. Technically, my break into wrestling was through like video games on the Nintendo and Super Nintendo. But my first time ever watching wrestling was Kane's debut. So, oh, wow. so like that, I also had a pretty good shot on my own, too, because I was like, what is happening right now? Because, of course, I knew who The Undertaker was from all the video games. But I was like... Who? What? He's got a brother? Because this was way back before the internet, everything back in the day. I was like, okay, this is well, where I'm getting hooked. <laughs> that's what I love about, about pro wrestling. Even even now as a man in his mid-40s, that's what I love about it. I love the creativity. I love the creation of emotion. I mean, 
even this past WrestleMania with the uniqueness of it being in an empty building and, and a new way of creating emotion, a new way of creating intrigue. What I love about pro wrestling is you're, you're technically only limited by your imagination. I mean, yes, there were foundational rules, and I'm definitely you know, a, a believer in the necessity of having rules and giving the referee legitimacy. And you know, I'm not the biggest fan of every match is hardcore and you make the referee look like an idiot and you don't listen to the five count during a tag team match. I'm definitely a believer in some of those old school fundamentals with pro wrestling. But other than that, uh, you know, whatever, whatever you can dream up. And, and what I love about pro wrestling, you know, with regards to saying that, is whatever is happening in the world around you, a great storyteller in wrestling will adapt to whatever's happening around you. I mean, is it any, is it any shock? It shouldn't be a shock to people that there's the WWE and now AEW doing shows in empty buildings. Damn right. We've been, we've been doing practices and doing shows in empty buildings for the last 10, 12 years of my life. Some of my greatest matches took place in front of nobody. So, I mean, I, that right there is, is why, why I love it so much. And I think why anybody who's in the business really loves it is, is just this ability to create emotion. You never forget that emotion. Like you bring up Kane, I'm bringing up old Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair. What is what do we have in common with it? Emotion. It brought some. It stirred something inside of us. Oh yeah, pure pure nostalgia. Now looking back on it, but at the moment it was like a visceral feeling of like this is a new chapter in my life. Oh, I, 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 absolutely. I mean, I, I know a lot of people are diehard sports fans. For me, I, I've been I've been a sports fan throughout my life. At this stage of my life, I couldn't be bothered with sports. I think it's a waste of time. But that's another issue for another day. Um, you know, what is it what people love about sports? They love emotion. What is it that people love about movies? They love emotion. Well, I, I'm not as interested in movies or sports as I am pro wrestling. Um, you know, and that's what it is that draws you in. Is it, It's emotion. It's, you know, there's, there's some sort of um, reality-based uh, documentary movie that was made on wrestling years ago. I don't, I don't remember what it was. All I remember is there's a scene of Vince McMahon going, We make movies! We make movies. We tell stories. We make movies, and I and it's just like yes, yes, <laughs> yes. I That's love that. You're doing, you're yeah. doing a 15 minute theatrical presentation. This it's is not a sport. It's you know, it, it's not Shakespeare. It's this weird hybrid of both, and it's a theatrical presentation, whatever it is. And that's a great way of looking at it. And I always like the ability to tell a good story in the ring. And something I always like to say is that I appreciate the high flying moves and obviously anything that looks incredibly athletic. But at the same time, for me, it's all about storytelling. And I and I, and I always say this: Cody versus Dustin last year was my favorite match of the year because it felt like such an intense storytelling match. It was like twenty wrestling moves during the entire match, but I was captivated the entire time. And I once heard this expression: "It was if you move really fast, people will watch; but if you're really interesting, people will wait for you to move." Oh, I mean, yeah, that's a great. Wow, that's outstanding. Yeah, yeah. So, well, yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, um, yeah, I like it was a great match. Uh, you know, it's in, and it's funny because our reference points are completely different and unique. But who cares? It's it's art. It's all subjective. So, if that's what what interested you, then let's talk about it. But yeah, I I, I saw the match and I agree with you. Yeah, and, and that's definitely one of those situations where you know. I, one of the other things that's great about something like pro wrestling, and you're you're really seeing it with the Undertaker, is there's there's that element of you know the grizzled the grizzled war veteran, the guy who's seen so many battles. You know, it's uh, you know Lemmy from Motorhead. I remember him seeing an interview with him, and he said, uh, "Wisdom and treachery will will beat youth and vigor always." And I just was laughed at, like, of course Lemmy would say something like that. But I think of the Undertaker now, right? And and so that you know that you you even look at what they did at WrestleMania with the theatrical presentation with the Undertaker, I just, I loved it. I oh, loved me it too. So much because there there it was. It was it was the grizzled war veteran that has seen so many wars. Yeah, you're gonna hurt him. Yeah, he's old and slow, but he's got a few tricks up his sleeve. And that was brilliant storytelling, which of course is exactly why I love pro wrestling. Brilliant storytelling. 
I hadn't felt that way about an Undertaker match in a really long time because I'll I'll be the first to admit the Undertaker has been my favorite wrestler of all time. Like back oh, in the cool. day, yeah. Like I the feeling that I would get whenever his gong would hit, like I still get the chills even to this day at 31 years old. But like this match that he had at WrestleMania against AJ Styles was so unique, and it was something that was completely out of the wheelhouse I've ever seen the Undertaker do in a match. But in my opinion, that was his best match since like. Shawn Michaels, you know what I mean? Or yeah, like, but it's just like to me, I was like, okay, he's not the in ring, uh, the the player that he used to be. He's getting older, but he's a t- storyteller. At fifty, you know what? You know, like he's still got all those years of experience, and it's all in his face, and all the way he can tell a story. You give that guy the ability to tell a story in an environment where he's not, you know, trying to lift up somebody who's like three hundred pounds for fifteen minutes, and the guy can go because like that was so good and intense. Well, you know, it, it's funny. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm not a diehard Undertaker fan by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm going to tell you something point blank. When um, I knew I was going to reinvent myself and, you know, get an opportunity to, to tell the types of stories I wanted to tell in pro wrestling, you know, years ago, uh, we're, you know, we're talking 12, 15 years ago when my imagination was running wild, The Undertaker was a reference point. Because what I loved about The Undertaker is I love, you know, Yokozuna, you know, burying him in the casket and The Undertaker is going to come back to life. And I, I love the stuff they did with Jake the Snake Roberts. And I love, you know, The, you know, the, the Undertaker. I mean, there's, there's so many. I, 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 I had just posted on my Instagram, which we'll talk about at the end of the interview, do some shameless self-promotion, <laughs> a great promo with the IRS character. And how IRS was digging up graves, and because these people owed back taxes, and so they didn't deserve a peaceful resting place. And he starts digging up graves, and the Undertaker steps in and is like, "What are you doing digging up graves?" And I remember thinking to myself, because I had been involved in the business as a referee for a handful of years before I suffered a pretty severe injury, and I remember, you know, realizing at the end of the day, the best matches to ref were character matches and where where I could be involved as a theatrical performer as the referee because the character and the storytelling was so strong and I kept referencing the undertaker and uh, that was where the stormbringer came from is is it, it it's it's my homage to the undertaker is can I create a character and create a personality that's so large and so big that the athletic aspect of wrestling actually becomes transcended by the theatrical presentation of pro wrestling. And based on the fact that we're having this interview, uh, and I've signed a few autographs as the Stormbringer, I think I think in my own little tiny way, I think I figured it out. But I'll tell you right now, the Stormbringer is a direct homage to The Undertaker. I love that so much, man. I really like hearing you talk because you speak with such eloquence. And when you when you tell you know like when you're speaking, it's just like I'm listening to you just tell a story, and I'm just sitting here going like, I'm I'm listening to this podcast as the podcaster. <laughs> oh well, 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 thank you. And and most people who know me well will will uh, will tell you that I am uh, a, a great artist when it comes to spewing bullcrap. It's fantastic. Well, oh, that's actually a great place for us to kind of transition to there. So how did you start in the business? How did you get go from kid who loves watching wrestling to I'm getting in a ring now? Went to a Stampede Wrestling show out at the exhibition in Lethbridge, Alberta. And there was about 50 people there. And uh, they, uh, the ring announcer said, if uh, anybody wants to learn how to do this, if you got the guts to stand up in front of this crowd and walk through that curtain and introduce yourself to Bruce Hart, who they build as one of the greatest professional wrestling coaches, teachers, uh, instructors in the world, which I would agree with, by the mm-hmm. way. And uh, I went, so I did it. Uh, but terrified, don't get me wrong. Of course, they're, you know, like, of course, I'll pat myself on the back for being courageous. Uh, I was absolutely terrified, but yeah, I was the weirdo who stood up and walked past the wrestlers and walked into the back curtain and spotted Bruce Hart and walked up to Bruce Hart, shook his hand and said, I want to learn how to be a pro wrestler. If I recall correctly, I think he laughed in my face. (laughs) Bay, it worked out for you. (laughs) He gave me his phone number, um, you know, and uh, it was, it was a journey getting up into the old heart dungeon, but I got, I got up into the old heart dungeon um, and, uh, you know, started learning. I was terrible. Uh, I'm, I won't, I'll, I'll be 100% honest with your audience, uh, which, of course, is my audience. 
I am the other way around of most people who get into wrestling. Most people who get into wrestling are great athletes and they learn how to become performers. I was a performer. I had experience in radio and television announcing. Uh, I was the drama nerd in high school. I wasn't an athlete. I was the drama nerd who had to learn how to become an athlete. So I was the exact opposite. Thank God, and I say thank God intentionally, the Hart family clued in, and they started to take care of me because they were like, you're different than everybody else. You can talk. You know, like they would, you know, you'd be in the middle of the dungeon and, you know, it, it started to become a joke about, you know, me cutting a promo on somebody and I'm in there with former CFL football players. I'm in there with former WHL hockey players, if I remember correctly. There was a guy named Olcom Albright who had come in there right off of Olympia bodybuilding, wow. IFBB pro bodybuilding. I mean, I was so in over my head, but I could talk. And uh, they, they just pulled me aside one day and they said, hey, we've got a television deal. We need a referee uh, who can communicate at a high level. We want it to be you. And I remember, you know, you know you're in there with a, you know, with a group of guys that are, you know, that all see themselves as the next Stone Cold Steve Austin. And, of course, you should have that type of confidence. And, um, you know, Ironically, it was TJ Wilson, uh, WWE Tyson Kidd. I'll never forget it. I just looked at him and he nodded, and 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 I and you know he basically probably was nodding because he goes, "My God, you're physically awful, but <laughs> you do have something." And uh, I remember looking at him of all people, and he nodded, and I was like, "Yeah, I'll be the ref." And uh, the rest is history. I became the referee that would cut heel promos at live events, and. Uh, you know, and learned. And, um, you know, Davy Boy Smith Jr., Harry, TJ, uh, guys like that, um, you know, I, I, you know, for whatever reason, I'm incredibly lucky. Ross Hart, Bruce Hart, um, you know, Ellie Hart, Jim Neidhart's wife, Natty's mother, you see her on the reality show. Uh, they all took kind of an interest in me. And they all, uh, you know, they all helped me. And, you know, they, you know, it was little things like, like training in the ring in Stu Hart's backyard and, and, uh, you know, Harry and TJ would be like, man, you sell really well. I'm like, oh my God, I'm, I, you know, I, I paid money. I, I remember those kids working a tag team match in 1996 when I saw Shawn Michaels and Vader headline a show at the Saddle Dome and the Hart kids were the opening match on the show. And, uh, you know, for a guy who, who didn't have an athletic background to have those guys take an interest in me and, and, you know, be showing me how to take an arm drag without killing myself and suplexing me and, and body slamming me in Stu Hart's backyard and down in the dungeon. I mean, you know, talk about living a dream, you know, slash nightmare. I mean, I was terrified, so in over my head. But the rest is history. And I, I broke in as a referee on television. Uh, in fact, if you see that Mauro Ranallo uh, documentary on Showtime, I guess in Canada it would be Crave, there's a brief five seconds I'm in that documentary when Mauro Ranallo is talking about his Stampede wrestling days. And I'm like, oh my God, there I am. <laughs> I like, called my mom because my mom had it on her, on her PVR. And I'm like, you're not going to believe this. You're going to have to watch quickly. It's a blink of an eye. But there I am in that referee persona standing behind Mauro, Mauro, Mauro Ronaldo during a Stampede Wrestling television segment. So pretty amazing that that was where it started. Mamma Mia, that's amazing. I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Amazing to me. And no, that's, that's really cool because, like, everybody's kind of got their own, like, background shot where everybody's like, I was in this thing for, like, you know what I mean? And you get really proud of it. I'm in a couple of them myself. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Well, but you know, and, and then from there... Uh, you know, they, you know, the, the hearts were trying to expand Stampede Wrestling into all their old marketplaces. Mm -hmm. And I heard them complaining about needing local promoters to work with them, like the old days. And I basically just asked, I said, well, what does it take to be a local promoter? And uh, the girl that I was in a relationship with at the time had a real entrepreneurial spirit. And we decided to promote Stampede Wrestling shows uh, in Lethbridge, Alberta. And, you know, I remember having a moment where I went, you know, and this isn't a slight towards the hearts at all. So don't misinterpret how I say this. 
uh, I will always be eternally grateful to the Hart family for, for what I learned and what they taught me. And, and I will always be so proud that I, you know, it, I mean, the hearts were at the end. I mean, Davy, Davy Boy Smith passed away. Stu Hart passed away. There was the horrible accident with Owen. Um, you know, they were surrounded by tragedy. Uh, I don't hold it against them that they were distracted by tragedy and that Stampede Wrestling just never really flourished and never really got going. How could it? I mean, they were surrounded by tragedy and that wasn't their fault. Um, but they, they took a lot of time. All the people that I mentioned earlier took a lot of time to teach me and, and really embrace how much this idiot just lived and loved pro wrestling. And, uh, my personal opinion, I don't think a person could ever learn from anything better. Uh, another guy I should give a lot of credit to a name that you don't hear mentioned anywhere near enough is bad news. Brown, bad news. Allen. Uh, there was a lot of time that Bad News would sit backstage with me and talk to me about psychology. And, you know, he would watch a match that I refereed and, you know, he would immediately have a, a comment about my refereeing, about where I needed to be more assertive, where I needed to pull back and not steal the show. But he would also explain why he thought a match was good and why he thought a match was bad. And, I mean, my God, like, I would just sit there. I don't think I would blink when Bad News would talk to me and take time with me. I mean, I remember spending time with Dory Funk Jr. There was a relationship between Bruce Hart and Dory Funk Jr. And I remember Dory Funk, I, I love your passion. Oh, my God. A former NWA world champion wants to talk to me. I mean, it was, just, it was unbelievable. But, you know, when we, were, when we were promoting the shows, you know, I just always said in the back of my mind, if I can turn a bit of a profit with a product, that, you know, I mean, when, you know, when I'm promoting a Stampede Wrestling show, I'm promoting Bruce and Ross's vision. And, you know, it's like anything else artistic. You don't always agree with the songwriter. You don't always agree with the vision. And so I always said in the back of my mind, I wonder what I could do if I really believed and really loved the product. And, uh, you know, fast forward a little bit of time after that, the concept of me becoming a promoter with Power Zone Wrestling came about. And I mean, I was just so lucky. I captured lightning in a bottle. There were so many amazing people that were involved with it when I was promoting and booking and uh, storm wrestling Academy was flourishing. And so, I mean, you just had this incredible pipeline of talent and I got pretty lucky with some of the guys who were willing to learn, you know, just the fundamentals of the art form off of me. And uh, man, I had a handful of really, really good years promoting, um, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. There was the Chris Benoit Dark Side of the Ring documentary that came out a couple of weeks ago. And I was talking to a friend of mine that was a talent within Power Zone Wrestling. And he reminded me, he goes, do you remember how weird it was to go do wrestling shows right after Chris, the Chris Benoit tragedy? And I had forgotten about that. I mean, we were running wrestling shows in the Ruthless Aggression era. So we were an incredibly violent company. I mean, there was blood and ladders and barbed wire and, and everything. And I was a huge part of that performing. Don't regret it. Never, I'll never go back to that style of performing. Um, don't regret it. Great experience. I was a huge Mick Foley Cactus Jack fan. So, again, got to emulate one of my heroes. Um, but I uh, got to be honest with you, I'm a bigger fan of emulating dude love at this point in my life. <laughs> um, but... Uh, um, you know, we were, we were, you know, wrestling wasn't cool. You know, if you watch the Ruthless Aggression documentary on the network, they'll talk about how the numbers were tanking. And uh, that's when we were running an indie wrestling company. And uh, the Chris Benoit stuff happened. And, you know, I think one of, the, one of the biggest regrets I have in pro wrestling is actually acknowledging the Chris Benoit tragedy. I, I wish I hadn't have done, in quotation marks, a shoot interview uh, in local media with regards to the Chris Benoit tragedy. Uh, I said earlier in the, in the interview about always looking forward, never looking back. That was a mistake. I shouldn't have acknowledged it. I should have just been looking ahead. But that's a learning experience. Why live your life in somebody else's tragedy, right? 100%. But, uh, the fact that, that uh, ultimately when we closed the doors, we, we just reached a point where we had so much going against us. Um, you know, coming off the Attitude Era, a lot of sponsors were afraid of wrestling. Uh, a lot of venues were afraid of wrestling. And, you know, we, we were kind of embracing coming off the Attitude Era and the Ruthless Aggression Era. Um, you know, I loved, I loved 
you know, some of the stuff that JBL was doing with Eddie Guerrero. So, you know, I did it with my, with that incarnation of the Storm Ringer, you know, really locked some edges, let's be honest, you know, kind of slightly overstepped boundaries and lines and tried to titillate and tried to get people talking. And, um, you know, it just, it ran its course. I mean, you know, I looked at uh, my business partners at the time, a performer named Canadian Dream and Cowboy was part of the ownership group at that time. And we just kind of felt like, hey, let's move on to other parts of our lives and uh, we can be proud of what we accomplished. And then lo and behold, a handful of years later, Cowboy is involved with PPW. He's having issues with uh, Travis the Heat Copeland, who uh, I knew from the old Power Zone wrestling days. And Cowboy goes, I would sure like your help kicking the crap out of THC. And the rest is history. Here we are again in PPW. That's awesome. So that that going through a couple of the questions that I wanted to go there, but you were following my question storyline so perfectly, and I didn't even need to interrupt because I was going to ask about being a promoter and all that stuff. So I was like, bah, so perfect. You've done this obviously before. <laughs> Yeah, it ain't my first rodeo. But, it's clearly uh, not your first I'm rodeo. Grateful to be on the bull in, uh, in this rodeo right now. Well, I got a couple quick questions here for you, yeah. some fun ones for you. So, as a promoter, obviously, it's as people like to say when you're when you're a wrestler, you know, you go to the venue, you get your match. You're really worried about your match. You know, maybe assembling the ring, bringing the ring down. You know, having you know, protecting everybody. But as a promoter, there's a million different hats that you have to wear all at one time, from not yeah. just match to match, but like the whole promotion, venues ahead of time, insurance, everything that goes into it. What was the hardest thing that you had to learn becoming a promoter from being a wrestler to begin with? <sighs> You know what was you know what was the hardest thing to learn? Mm. The hardest part was and and it was hard. And my girlfriend at the time and and cowboy here will tell you I cried a lot. It was really hard to see people suffer major injuries in my wrestling company. It was really hard. And I'll I'll tell you the stone cold truth about something. I I basically had just about a nervous breakdown. Um, you know I was beat up and injured. Uh, I'm naturally a loner. Um, I'm not, I'm not a, like I can communicate at a high level, you know, which I'd like to think I'm doing in this interview, but my natural instinct is to want to be by myself. I'm an only child. Um, I have a very disjointed family and I've always been okay with that. Like I, I've, I've been a guy who has tons of memories of even as a teenager sitting at home by himself on Christmas day and just thanking baby Jesus for the quality of life I have. Um, you know, I'm very comfortable being alone. And so it, it was it was very, very overwhelming to be in a situation where my phone is constantly blowing up. And, and, and you know, when you own a business, anybody who owns a business, even you doing what you're doing here, it seems like you tend to deal with more BS than you do victories. And when people seek out your attention, they tend to seek out your attention with BS more than they seek it out with, hey, Here's something great. Um, I, I, that's one thing I found with talent that was really frustrating is they would always tell you everything they didn't want to do, but they wouldn't tell you what they wanted to do. And, and you would have unhappy talent because I hadn't booked them to win in, in well over a year and they felt they were worth more and they wanted bigger paydays. And so I'd be like, well, explain to me why. Maybe you're right. I'm, I'm probably wrong. Um, hey, Remind me to tell you about some of my biggest mistakes in booking talent. You're going to laugh your ass off of what I share with you. Um, but uh, at any rate, you know, a lot of times with the talent, they would, they would struggle to be able to tell you what they really wanted. They would just tell you what they, they didn't want, which, of course, is very difficult to work with. And so that really overwhelmed me and because just me as a personality. It's just not my comfort zone. But the big one for me that was really hard was having talent, you know, like these 21-year-old kids that would land on the top of their head on purpose because they saw it on some Japanese wrestling match. And I was like, dude, please do not break your neck in my wrestling ring. I remember a talent named Scott Lee Crew splitting his head open. Cowboy will tell you, I cried about it. I, I, I don't know why it was him. But when he split his head open, I bawled like a baby afterwards because I just hated the fact that this kid could have destroyed the rest of his life in my wrestling ring. When, when Power Zone ended, that was actually one of the hardest parts for me was I felt a lot of guilt 
about a lot of broken relationships with people, about talent that had hurt themselves, about people who sacrificed personally to be a part of what we did and it wasn't a rewarding experience for them. I'll be honest with you, I, I, I intentionally put myself um, in counseling just to have somebody to talk to about this crap. Because who, who could relate? No woman I could date could relate. No coworker could relate. Nobody could relate. So I screamed and yelled in a counselor's office and got it all out. And was like, all right, thank you. <laughs> I can move on with my life now. Well, the important part was you took care of yourself afterwards, right? Like you're like, okay, obviously I need help. I need to be able to talk about this or else I'm just going to go insane. So I, you, I, I vibrate. I, I mean, I remember Britain coming to my house, cowboy coming to my house. And I looked at cowboy and I go, I can't stop shaking. I literally can't stop shaking. I sat on the floor and was just shaking. I was just in, in such another world. So, you know, to, to talk about the present with PPW, um, you know, it's, it, it, to be in their position and bring in a guy like me as a talent, I can only imagine how hard it was for them because they're like, okay, what's going to happen? Because, you know, you ask any indie, indie wrestling promoter in North America, they'll tell you working with a, a guy who has booked and promoted is really difficult. But, um, you know, thankfully, you know, Sydney Steele is at the top of PPW. Uh, I have an unbelievable amount of respect for him, period you know, as a talent, as a human being. And so that was one of the things where I was like, man, this is going to be really exciting because I get to come in to a situation as a talent in Southern Alberta, which is, which is in my opinion, the, the greatest place on earth. This little pocket in Southern Alberta is the greatest place on earth. And I get to bring the greatest form of entertainment to this, this population one more time with the guy at the helm at the top of the company that I have immense respect for, immense respect for. And, and so, you know, it's all working out. Yeah. I have to say when I got down to PPW for my first show down there at the power rebel, I was blown away. I was like, what is this? You know how they called buddy Murphy, the best kept secret in wrestling. Clearly that's not the case. It was down there in Lethbridge wrestling. I was like, okay, have you guys seen what's going on down here in Lethbridge? Cause this is insane. <laughs> well, well, thank you. I, you know, I, I appreciate that as a talent and I, and I appreciate that for a lot of people that are, uh, that are working their asses off down here. I mean, you know, I'm nearly 50 years old and, uh, you know, to, to be able to tap into some of this youth down here and some of this energy, I, 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 I think these kids down here have added 10 years to my life. I have no doubt in my mind about that. I mean, it's it's just been an incredible honor to be a part of it. And, and I mean, you know, I still remember, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm a big believer in kayfabe, so I'm going to intentionally speak vaguely with what I'm about to, to bring up. But I remember watching the television product and when Cowboy was first approaching me about getting involved with PPW, and I remember watching the television product and seeing Jumping Josh for the first time and uh, just feeling this this tingle inside of me like man i want to wrestle this little kid <laughs> and and you know to, to to have the opportunity like it's such a blessing and and i mean i i would consider myself a christian so you know i can say this comfortably it's such a blessing from god to be able to have inspiration to be able to to feel this tingle inside of you where you, you can't sleep as a grown man, not because you're anxious, not because you're scared, but because you're inspired. And to be in my early 40s, mid 40s now, going on late 40s, to watch this, this little kid, literally a little kid on TV, and just feel this inspiration. Oh, man, how lucky am I? And, and of course, I've had some unbelievable moments with Jumping Josh. I'm sure I'll have more unbelievable moments with Jumping Josh. And uh, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that kid has no future in pro wrestling. And I'm the reason why. <laughs> I like the way you said that. <laughs> but uh, hey, I'll tell you something really funny because, um, you know, I, I often laugh at, at the old power zone days because I'm going to share something with you that is just going to make you howl. Um, I, I, I joke quite often with the PPW management that um, I, I had balls but I wasn't good at it. 
I was not good at promoting and booking talent. I just had the balls and the courage to go for it. Um, I, I joke with them all the time about, and, and I don't know if they know this, this is what I'm referencing, and you're going to die at this. Okay, so I have had the opportunity to book three world champions, and I never booked any of them. You ready for this? Okay, okay. Kenny Omega used to email me from Winnipeg. Oh, from PCW I days? I, 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 I'm in the PCW days. I never booked <laughs> Kenny Omega. Okay. No, for no reason other than I just never got around to it. Okay, fair, Jinder fair. Mahal, Jinder Mahal approached me personally, walked up to me. I went to the, when Bon Jovi played the Saddle Dome during the Calgary Stampede, he spotted me and he walked up to me, introduced himself, and, and, you know, we talked about how, how he watched our product and he really wanted to be involved and he wasn't looking for money. He was just looking for opportunity, all, you know, all, the, all the, the classy things to say. And I have no doubt in my mind he meant every word of it. Never booked Ginger Mahal. No, for no reason other than I just never got around to it. Right. I was approached by people involved with ACCW out in Vancouver about booking American Dragon. If anybody out there doesn't know who American Dragon is. You mean is, Daniel Bryan? It's Daniel Bryan. <laughs> oh, man. Again, I just never got around to it. <laughs> Matthias Wild was basically my curtain jerker for the longest time that I knew could have a good 10-minute match to open the show. Calls me insanely frustrated one night about how he's better than what I'm giving him the opportunity and I need to get behind him. And, and it, it turned into a bit of a confrontational phone call. <laughs> Excuse me. He felt he was worth more money than he was getting paid. Blah 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 blah. I disagreed. I wished him well. Off he went, and Matthias Wild became Tyler Breeze. Uh, I, I was going to say Matthias Clement or whatever his real name is, or whatever. <laughs> like, I laugh my ass off at the fact that I that I had you know the opportunity to book all these amazing talents, and I blew it all. You know what they say? Hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Oh, is it? But you know what? You know, props to all those names I mentioned for going off and becoming the superstars that they became. And uh, you know, thank thank goodness I've had a great life because I I joke with Cowboy. I go, my God, would I be depressed if my life wasn't going well in my forties? Eh? <laughs> you just be like, I could have booked Jinder, I could have booked Daniel Bryan, I could have booked Kenny Omega. <laughs> do, you, do you realize at that given moment? Uh, on on my card, I could have had Kenny Omega versus Jinder Mahal. That would have been <laughs> I never, amazing. I, I just never got around to it. You know, you, it was a busy Thursday. You know, people were busy. Uh, what, a, what, a, what a wild ride. But I'll tell you something truthfully. The fact that I had created something that those guys wanted to be a part of. I mean, yeah, of course, I could kill. I could, you know, you know, you know, theoretically kill myself inside over it. Or I could also say to myself, can you believe I created something that, that world champions wanted to be a part of? And uh, that, that's what I like to think of, is I created something that world champions wanted to be a part of. Here's... So I, thought I'd share, I thought I'd share that with you and your audience, because uh, I, I, just, I, I don't think there's a week that goes by when I see Jinder Mahal or I see Kenny Omega, and I just laugh. I just laugh to myself, and I'm like, oh my word, those guys were... We're, we're wanting to work with me so bad, and I, I just never got around to it. <laughs> Here, here's, here's how I will put it in your head in another way. You could think of it this way. You never booked them, true, but maybe they would never have become what they became had they had different opportunities where they were on their path to, right? Maybe had they worked for you, maybe they wouldn't have had another opportunity where they would have met another person, and you know what I mean? Maybe they wouldn't have oh, become those people. <laughs> isn't, isn't it crazy how life works that way, right? I it's, mean, yeah. Even, you know, it, it's it's funny. Um, I brought up bad news, Brown. When I so so I blew both my knees out at the same time. Um, you know, when I was when they were going to transition me from being a referee to being a talent, I had a moment where I jumped off the edge of the ring to attack, uh, which would be a talent that was planted in the crowd who was who was pestering me as a referee, and we had a confrontation. And I was to jump off the ring and then jump into the audience and attack them. When I jumped off the ring, a kid had spilled a soda pop. And so when I landed on the pavement, both my knees blew out at the same time. Oh. And so there, there went me being an in-ring talent. So, you know, and, and, and God bless the hearts for this, but they, 
you know, they knew how much I loved being, being in the ring and loved being a part of the industry. And so they kept booking me as a referee and I tried to referee matches with these big bulky knee braces on and it, it, and it just wasn't working. And I was, I was blowing spots because I was too slow, you know, with these knee braces on. And I remember, you know, I was, I was pretty upset. I missed out on a main event. Um, Sabu was booked to wrestle Johnny Devine and they, the referee had to take a bump and they just realized, you know, uh, my refereeing name at the time was Oscar Wilde, and they were like, "Well, Oscar Wilde's going to blow the spot with his blown out knees. We can't risk having him in there." And so they pulled me from the match and put another, you know, put just a kid who'd barely ever ref before in there. If I remember correctly, I might not be right, but if I remember correctly, and um, I was just so distraught, and I was fighting back tears, sitting in the corner backstage by myself. And Bad News came and sat down beside me, and he looked at me and he goes. You know, and I remember it very distinctly. And people who know Bad News Brown will be like, yeah, that's something Bad News would do. And he, he just, he, you know, he kind of looked at me with disgust, kind of like a disgusted father. And he goes, what are you doing? He goes, why, why are you doing this to yourself? He goes, the wrestling industry will be here. He goes, you need to go home. He goes, you need to let go. You need to, to take care of your body, rebuild, and the wrestling industry will be here. And, and he literally said something along the lines of, as he said, even if this, this exact thing isn't here, wrestling will be here. You will find your way back in. He goes, you have something. He goes, you have something that a lot of people don't have. And he, he didn't go into great detail. That wasn't the point of the conversation. But it, it's, it's one of the most life-changing moments of my life. I mean, the fact that Bad News Brown showed that, you know, and it could have just been him being a father, just going, my God, look at this poor broken guy. And, uh, you know, that was, you know, that was something that just meant so much to me. And, and I, I did exactly what he said. I, I, I left for a long time and um, I dropped a bunch of weight. I got in substantially better shape and, um, you know, had one of my knees rebuilt surgically and eventually and inevitably found my way back in man that i i really enjoy your stories i just like i sit here and i just go like i could just listen to you talk for a long time it's like you and mike quackenbush just have this way of talking where i just lose myself in your words it's so much fun well <laughs> oh, thank you thank you very much i appreciate that greatly i have thank a couple you. i have a couple quick fire questions here for you before we hey. do wrap up here today and this is one question i like to ask everybody that i've had on my podcast Throughout history, there's been a million different championships in wrestling. Um, you know, whether it be a belt or a sword or a shield, like there's been a whole bunch of different championships. If you could ever be the holder of a title or a championship throughout history, what would you love to call your title? It could be any title. What, what would I love to call my title? Yeah, like which one would you love to hold? Would you like, you know, like would you love to be the NWA World Heavyweight Champion? Would you love oh, to hold the old smoking what, what, skull like, belt? What, 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 what historical championship? Exactly. Like, ideally, would mean the most to me. Yeah, like if you could say that, like the, uh, the old Eagle WWE or I guess WWF Championship, that, the Winged uh, Eagle Hulk Belt, Hogan, Randy Savage, the Ultimate Warrior, the old Eagle, yeah. the old Eagle Belt. I like yeah. that. That's a great answer. That's a really good answer. <laughs> yeah, that you know, like it, that that one definitely the old ego belt, the ego belt. And I'll be really honest with you, um, you know, the Power Zone Wrestling Championship. We spent a lot of money on it. Um, we had it made by Reg Parks, who had made a lot of the old championship belts, the UFC championship belts. We dropped a pretty penny on on the PCW championship. Because my attitude was, and this is, this is, you know, here's me being a mark, but also treating the business with unbelievable respect because I do have an unbelievable amount of respect for the wrestling industry, probably too much respect for it. Um, you know, my attitude was you wanted that belt to really, if I wanted people to fight tooth and nail, um, both backstage politically with me and in the ring as an in-ring performer to hold that belt, then I wanted that belt to not be a replica to not be a toy, but to be something that was ours. And it was the power zone wrestling championship was uniquely ours, but it was, it was, it was the real deal. It was the very guy who designed and made every major championship belt in professional wrestling made the, the power zone belt. And, you know, 
it, it's tough when you're when you're a, a, a booker and promoter and you book yourself into the championship. Um, a talent named Adrian Walls, who will probably hear this, um, he he deserves a lot of credit for me being where I am right now. He was he was a guy who you know really invested emotionally into what my vision was. And uh, if you look at the history of Power Zone Wrestling. Adrian Walls was the greatest champion we ever had. Uh, there was never a bad Adrian Walls championship match. Adrian Walls made the Storm Ringer. And the fact that a guy who could break my arm in 30 seconds in a shoot fight would lay down for me will always mean the world. Because the biggest reason why the Storm Ringer was looked at as a legitimate champion of the very belt that I owned and created was him. He was the reason why I was taken seriously as a champion because everybody knew beating Adrian Walls was a big deal. And I'll be honest with you, um, you know, to be able to look at that championship belt sitting on my mantle uh, in my house and know that it meant something and that when I was fortunate enough to hold it, um, you know, of course, like, like politically, you know, the talent, any, you know, any good talent wants to see themselves as the champion. So, of course, you know, there's a part of any talent in our locker room who would resent me being the power zone champion with that belt. But I also know that every talent in our locker room wanted to work with me for that belt and have a great match with me for that belt. And that, that means a lot to me. But I, I can't stress enough. Um, I think one of the most underrated talents in the history of the business was Adrian Walls, and I and uh, and I, you know, I'm glad that my uh, my memory was spurned in this conversation that I can give that guy the credit he deserves. Oh, that's really great. I, I was looking back on the Power Zone uh, wrestling days, and I saw the name. And unfortunately, I've never seen one of his matches. But I was like looking at his name. I was like, this guy was clearly a major player in uh, PZW because I was like, his name is appearing everywhere. He was legit. I mean, that was the thing. Um, you know, again, at the at, at that time period, UFC was beginning to explode. I mean, that was a time period when a lot of grown men would have left being a wrestling fan and gravitated towards UFC. And you know, Adrian Walls was legit. He was he was a karate black belt, if I recall correctly. I believe he was a really successful karate instructor. Um, you know, if I recall correctly, I, I'm not a martial arts guy, so if he's hearing this, I apologize if I'm not uh, giving you those proper props. But he was legit. You got to remember, remember earlier I shared with you, I was a performer who learned how to become an athlete. Mm-hmm. This is a guy who probably could have made money in mixed martial arts. He probably would have made more money in mixed martial arts than he did pro wrestling. And this was a guy willing to work with me. I mean, oh, I mean, that guy could have broke my arm in 30 seconds if he wanted to, but he never did. He brought out the, some of the greatest moments of my professional wrestling life. Um, he, you know, I, I, I joke with many a talent, and um, I'm going to slightly break kayfabe here, and uh, I'm not one for doing that. I, 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 I will be very, 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 very grateful for many unbelievably talented people who have come down to my level <laughs> because <laughs> they knew I could bring out an unforgettable performance, but they would have to bring themselves down to my level athletically. Uh, my, my greatest hero in pro wrestling is Hulk Hogan. And, and, you know, it's easy to pick apart Hulk Hogan, but come on, man, it's Hulk Hogan. <laughs> I'll say this. Hulk Hogan is not my favorite wrestler of all time. Uh, but when I go back and I watch some of the matches that he had when he would wrestle in Japan, I would go, holy crap, he is really, really good. I wish I could see more of this type of wrestling from him inside of North America. But that wasn't what was popular at the time here. But when I would oh, go back and watch some of those matches, I was like, wow. <laughs> never forget, you're a, you're an Undertaker fan. Never forget, Hulk Hogan was probably the talent that, that put the Undertaker on the map the most. Yep, I, I would Hulk say Hogan that. Yep. lost to him. I'll say this. A lot of people say that Hulk Hogan never put that many people over. No, he just put over the right people. And then there's Goldberg. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a Goldberg guy. Fair enough. Hey, everybody's got different guys, right? I, 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 think, I think the thing I like about Bill Goldberg is I, I, I like monster trucks. Okay? Like, I, I like going to monster trucks and watching monster trucks crush cars and, 
the little, you know, one minute little drag race between two monster trucks. I've gone and, and seen hot rod shows and I'm not going to pretend I'm a mechanical person. I'm not, I don't have a clue, but I like the spectacle. And, you know, I, again, you know, WWE is, you know, talks about basically kind of being the big tent circus where there's something there for everybody. And I, I like, I like the fact that, that you've got this monster truck style and they put them in situations where it's two monster trucks cla clashing and, you know, there, there's the Indy 500 and there's monster trucks. And, um, you know, the Eddie Guerrero types are your Indy 500. The Goldberg types are your monster trucks. I'm a guy who prefers the monster truck. Hey, totally understandable. Like you said, wrestling, there's something there for everybody, right? And here's another great thing I really like about wrestling. Of all the different sports and everything happening in the world, wrestling's still thriving in an industry uh, that, you know, like other industries are just like, we don't, we can't, we can't do anything. <laughs> Do you, do you mean right now with the yeah with the whole co with the whole co with the whole COVID nineteen situation like right now wrestling it's staying on every major TV network you know what I mean everybody's still watching wrestling because it has the ability to adapt exactly and I think I think the other thing is is I think the people you know the people at the top of AEW I mean the last name is Rhodes for crying out loud mm -hmm. and and if you you look at the McMahon's and I guess that would include now Triple H at the top of WWE they're survivors. But there's, there's, a, there's a big middle finger to the world. And I think that's one of the things, like, like this, this little run of watching these empty arena shows and watching them trying new things and being creative, it's a middle finger to the world. And pro wrestling at its best is a middle finger to the world. Like, of course, you want to be embraced by millions of people. But I, I think at its best, there's a reason why, why one of the most successful eras in the history of pro wrestling was called the Attitude Era. Because it's a middle finger. And it's, and it's like, no, not even the Corona hoax. Yes, I'm saying that on purpose. That's another topic for another day. <laughs> not even the Corona hoax is going to slow down the world of pro wrestling. And in fact, pro wrestling is going to thrive. They're going to do things creatively they've never done before. That crazy entrance that Matt Hardy had in AEW. You'll, like, like, even if you didn't like it, you'll never forget it. Oh, you know, the, yeah. The Firefly Funhouse match. Even if you didn't like it, you'll never forget it. And that's the point. You'll never forget it. And of course, where where did you see some of the greatest, most innovative, crazy stuff in one of the craziest times in our lives? Pro wrestling. And that's exactly why I love it. I love that. Man, thank you for so much for joining me here today. But before we do let you go, obviously, plug your stuff. Where can people find you? Where can people listen to the Stormbringer? All right. So hit me up on Instagram at official Stormbringer. And uh, that's what I have the most fun with. And uh, as I like to say, it's pro wrestling, noticing and discussing. And uh, you'll see all sorts of crazy things that I find and throw on there and have fun with. And then from there on the official Stormbringer Instagram, there's a link to the Facebook page. The Facebook page, I try to make uh, a unique experience as well, where that's where more of the long form promos and, um, you know, documentaries out in the world that I find interesting that I want to throw on there. Um, you know, I've got a guy who is my best friend in the world who, uh, other than Cowboy, who helps me out with it. And uh, he's always putting all the uh, PPW stuff on there. Because I will also tell anybody listening to this, you know, you're right. PPW is one of the greatest secrets, you know, in pro wrestling. And I don't think it's going to be a secret for very much longer I don't think uh, it's going to be very long from now that uh, where we've been drawing hundreds consistently, I have no doubt in my mind that we're going to do a couple of shows where we pop a few thousand. Um, there's a great building here in this city, uh, a, a great arena. I have seen some of the greatest rock shows I've ever seen in my life at the arena here in Lethbridge. And damn it, you're going to see one of the greatest pro wrestling shows you've ever seen in your life at that arena. And Cowboy and I are going to be on it, as with everybody else in PPW, because it'll be us filling that building someday. I have no doubt in my mind about that. But um, all the PPW stuff is on my Facebook page that you can get on to through my Instagram. So once again, Instagram, official Stormbringer. Please join it. Uh, please come and have some fun. And uh, I'll, be, I'll warn everybody. I like pissing people off, but I also like making people think, and I don't want to just piss somebody off to make, you know, to, uh, you know, to freak people out or to be a cruel or mean person. 
But I think we live in a wild time right now. This corona thing going on, I think, is uh, an encapsulation of uh, what's been happening in the modern world. And either this is going to become a new normal, or this is going to be the beginning of a great awakening. So please follow official Stormringer on Instagram, and let's make this the beginning of a great awakening. Thank you so much, Stormringer, for joining me here today. That was awesome. I really enjoyed that. Obviously, I'm going to have you back on here in a couple of days when we have our interview alongside the cowboy as the bad seeds. But of course, I can't wait to sit down and chat with you again. Hopefully, like we said, whatever happens with this whole COVID-19 situation, I'm going to try to make it down to Lethbridge. And we're going to have that face-to-face interview that we were supposed to have. Oh, please, please, man, please. This was an honor. Uh, you're good at what you do, man. Thank and, you so much. <laughs> uh, this, was, this was an honor. Uh, thanks a million. And uh, we'll talk to you again real soon. All right. You have yourself a great day, buddy. A big thank you once again to the Stormbringer for joining me here today to talk his time in wrestling. Obviously, the man is incredibly tenured, has so much experience. So I, just like you, got to sit down and I just got to listen and absorb so much knowledge. And it was just so much It was just so great to listen to the Stormbringer. I cannot wait to do that again. Of course, this does kick off Bad Seeds Week as we will have our interview with the cowboy, Bryn Watts. Um, It's probably going to be on Thursday, I think. Uh, Things have changed a little bit, but it's going to be Thursday. And my interview with the Bad Seeds will be on Saturday. So remember to check out all of that. All of that is going to be happening here on uh, WrestleSode. Remember to hit that subscribe and like button. If you like what you heard here today, remember to leave us a five-star rating interview. If that is what you want to do, remember to go check out my website over at WrestleSode.com. Remember to go check out everything over at the Northern Alberta Invitational. And if you guys do want to support the WCSN, remember to go to the Win Column Sports Network at WinColumnSports.ca or over at Patreon.com forward slash the WCSN and uh, try to help out if you want to help out. Like I said, our content is always going to be free, though, so don't even feel pressured if you don't or can't. Have yourself a wonderful day, everybody, and I'll talk to you soon. (laughs) 